uh, so uh, welcome this morning to the Department of Surgery uh, monthly rounds of lectures and uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to the Palmer Lecture named after Dr. John Palmer. Uh, it's, in general terms, this is a general surgery lecture has been for many, many uh, years and we're delighted to welcome Dr. Scott Connor from the University of Iowa to be with us and to help with the introduction today and to introduce the Palmer Lecture. I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. Alan O'Kranick, who's uh, Chief of uh, General Surgery at the Toronto Western Hospital. Alan. Thanks so much, uh, Jim, for the opportunity to introduce uh, the Palmer Lectureship. Um, I'll say a few words about Dr. Palmer and then introduce uh, Dr. Carol Scott Connor. Um, Dr. John Palmer was born in Meaford, Ontario. He received his medical degree from the University of Toronto. He entered the galley training program in surgery at U of T, where he trained in both general and plastic surgery. He came on staff at the Toronto General in 1957 and quickly established uh, his reputation as an exceptional clinician and superb technical surgeon. His training in both general and plastic surgery allowed him to develop a special interest in malignant diseases of the head and neck. And through his close work with the radiotherapy group at PMH, he developed expertise in management of patients suffering intestinal complications of radiation therapy. He had an impressive and broad skill set. He was one of the first surgeons in Canada to perform the vertical, the vertical banded gastroplasty for morbid obesity. He was respected, admired by our surgical colleagues and trainees for sound judgment and masterful technical skills. He was also well known for one of his passions that he developed outside of work, which was painting. And he had a number of very successful exhibitions of his own paintings in Toronto galleries he passed away in 1984. Now, it is really a pleasure and honor to introduce this year's Palmer Lecturer, Dr. Carol Scott Connor. Dr. Scott Connor is Professor Emeritus and Chair Emeritus of the Department of Surgery at the University of Iowa at Carver College of Medicine. She received her undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from MIT and subsequently worked in electronics research laboratory of gt before medical school. She received her MD degree from New York University and subsequently uh, completed her general surgery residency there in 1981. She completed her PhD while on faculty and subsequently earned an MBA and a graduate certificate in narrative healthcare. She's currently enrolled in a Master of Arts in Creative Writing Program at Lamar Ryan University. Dr. Scott Connor is founding member of the Academy of Master Surgeon Educators she has received numerous teaching awards, including one of the most prestigious awards bestowed by SAGES, the Jeff Ponsky Master Educator Award. She's also received a Regents Award for Faculty Excellence and designation as a living legend by the American Medical Women's Association, just to name a few. She's held leadership positions in, nat in national organizations, including the Board of Governors of the American College of Surgeons. Dr. Scott Connor is a prolific and acclaimed surgeon writer. She's the author or editor of 10 surgical textbooks. I'm showing you a few of them here, including a series of monographs on various aspects of medical writing. Most of these have gone into numerous editions and translations. Several of these have won awards. She's also authored a book of short stories. You see here a few small moments in which she explores the space between surgeon and patient. In 1999, she began the first of a long series of committee involvements through the Institute of Medicine in the capacity advisory to NASA for various issues surrounding astronaut health care. These culminated in numerous reports and the ultimate appointment as chair of a standing committee. She currently serves as a member of the NASM Committee on Assessment and Strategies for Managing Cancer Risk Associated with Radiation Exposure During Crewed Space Missions. It is my uh, true uh, Pleasure to welcome Dr. Uh, Scott Connor to give this year's Palmer Lecture. Over to you, Dr. Scott Connor. Thank you. So uh, we're going to switch the slides over. It's such a pleasure to join all of you. And um, I want to thank you for the honor of addressing this group. You know, that I do so under the name of Dr. John Palmer, a true pathfinder and master surgeon, general and oncologic surgeon great technician, thoughtful clinician, gifted teacher, makes the honor all more meaningful. Just... 
I'm trying to figure out how to switch this. There we go. So I have no financial disclosures. Um, you know, Dr. John Palmer, as was mentioned, was a gifted artist. And I have a couple of his paintings, thanks to uh, Alan sending them to me. And I'd like to use them throughout the lecture to illustrate points. Before I speak to the title of my lecture, Recapturing Joy, we need to delineate some of the problems. To use Dr. Palmer's painting as a visual metaphor, we must wade into the swamp. The medical profession is beset by numerous stressors, and it seems that we surgeons, because of our very active and direct involvement in patient care, are stuck in the pain point between our patients and the system. I spent my entire career in academic surgery in the United States. My own career took me from the East Coast Megalopolis, where I grew up and trained, to three predominantly rural states, West Virginia, Mississippi, and Iowa. I stay in contact with former residents in both academic and private practice, and with surgeons in mostly rural practice around my area. And it's impossible not to be struck by the sense of unhappiness and frustration that many of my surgical colleagues feel. This misery stands in stark contrast to the sense of joy and vocation that called many of us to the practice of surgery. So a little disclaimer, I'm very familiar with the US system and you are the experts in the Canadian system. I hope you will take what I have to offer, change what needs to be changed and consider what may be of use to you, okay? Let's name some of the problems. Among these, drastically declining reimbursement, the rapid pace of technological innovation, increased specialization, closure of small hospitals and consolidation of hospital systems, weaponized peer review and the threat of litigation, dysfunctional electronic medical records, and the demand for 24 seven availability the barrage of electronic messages, emails, texts, cell phone calls, and many others. In addition, COVID has brought additional stressors. None of us, except perhaps science fiction writers, imagined the pandemic and the long dark night of the soul we've experienced. It has added, in addition to personal and family stress and fear and grief, it has added additional strictures on clinic time, fewer personnel, less OR time, less access to cancer screening and patients who are unwilling to come in for routine screening, and COVID protocols which make it difficult to get patients to the operating room. Personal stressors that are, are uh, perhaps exacerbated by the pandemic include the financial burdens in the U.S. tremendous uh, student debt that medical students incur, child care responsibilities, elder care, and impending retirement and the possibility that many may choose to retire early. So Dr. Daniel Ofrey, an attending physician at Bellevue Hospital, published an editorial in the New York Times with the inflammatory title, The Business of Healthcare Depends on Exploiting Doctors and Nurses. She wrote, one resource seems infinite and free, the professionalism of caregivers. The editorial leads off with a familiar scenario. You write your doctor's re daughter's recital, and you get a call that your elderly patient's son needs to talk to you urgently. Here's an example of the demand for instant access. She goes on to describe how one additional task after another is piled onto the clinical staff members who can't and won't say no. Uh, the references here are also available from a uh, list of references that I, I sent ahead of anyone else. The result of all this is an episode, a, an epidemic of burnout. Uh, in an ACS survey of governors, more than 50% of ACS governors reported experiencing burnout themselves at some point in their career. A previous survey of the membership in 2008 reported that this was a significant concern 
and Charlie Bausch wrote about the problem in 2010. This is not a new problem. In fact, burnout was first defined in 1975 by Freudenberg. What is it? We've all heard the term. It's, it was defined as a constellation of symptoms, malaise, fatigue, frustration, cynicism, and inefficiency that arise from excessive demands on energy, strength, or resources in the workplace. Key symptoms include a feeling of emotional exhaustion and a tendency to treat colleagues or patients as the object. If you do a PubMed search on burnout, you will find innumerable references documenting burnout in various clinician populations around the world. Burnout is the currently most accepted term used to describe clinician distress in an inherently dysfunctional system. The problem with the term burnout is that it seems to imply that if we were just stronger, smarter, better, we wouldn't burn out. As a surgeon, I don't like the concept. Maybe you don't either. What burns out? A defective light bulb, a candle guttering to its end. We'd like to think that surgeons do not burn out. Yet the very nature of our work and our ethos in the current environment predisposes us. We take on tough cases and expect excellent outcomes. We suffer, find workarounds, and continue to advocate for patients until the burden becomes unendurable. The very dedication and perfectionism upon which we surgeons pride ourselves may render us more susceptible. Failure to recognize the symptoms, to name the problem, leads to a delay in intervention. It's crucial to recognize that burnout is a symptom of a problem in the workplace, not a weakness of the clinician. In 2019, the National Academy of Medicine released a massive report. It was over 300 pages long. It's called Taking Action Against Clinician Burnout, a Systems Approach to Professional Wellbeing. Note the subtitle, a systems approach. What is needed is system-wide change as well as individual strategies to develop the personal resilience to survive these assaults. This entire report report is available free, online, downloadable from the National Academies. I prefer the term moral injury rather than burnout to describe the deep distress many of us are feeling. Moral injury is a term that was initially used to describe some of the symptoms of soldiers returning from the Vietnam War. Those with a constellation of symptoms that appeared to relate to threat to a soldier's moral fiber rather than threats to their own life, as in classic post-traumatic stress disorder. Wendy Dean described it as resulting in the medical environment from, quotes, the challenge of simultaneously knowing what care patients need, but being unable to provide it due to constraints that are beyond your control. Let's take a few minutes to think about it. The patient needs an operation, but you can't schedule it because of COVID. A, a woman comes to a clinic with metastatic breast cancer. She hasn't gone for mammograms because of the pandemic. You request a particular kind of instrument, maybe just a stapler or a particular suture, and are told that you have to use something else, something that someone somewhere has judged to be equivalent because the hospital has a contract with the manufacturer. To paraphrase Dean and others, Surgeons are smart, tough, durable, and resourceful. If we could have MacGyvered ourselves out of the situation by working harder, smarter, or differently, we would have done so. In fact, our constant efforts to MacGyver ourselves out of one or another bind and to get the care our patients need may have contributed to our ongoing burden of moral injury, the continued erosion of our moral fiber. I visualize a rope fraying against the sharp surface of the edge of a rocky cliff, strand by strand parting until it finally breaks. 
Because I believe that precisely naming the problem helps develop solutions, I want to give you another concept that also applies to surgeons, and that is the concept of the second victim. Whenever there is a complication, a medical error, or death, the first victim is the patient. The second victim, often forgotten, is the surgeon who feels responsible for the event. Remember the old saying that every surgeon carries a graveyard around in their head? That we walk through this graveyard periodically thinking about deaths and complications that might have been avoided? Who among us does not do that? When a complication or death is due to a medical error or a malpractice suit has been filed, the suffering for the surgeon is intensified, hence the term second victim. Because we intervene so directly and decisively in the lives of our patients, that is, we are uniquely privileged and allowed to inflict the controlled trauma of an operation, the inherent imperfections of our own art, and the deep sense of personal responsibility inculcated in us by our mentors comes back to haunt us in this way. Both the system and the surgeon need to take action to combat these assaults. At the system level, we need tort reform and a more rational system for compensating victims of errors. At the individual level, we must support each other when such an event occurs. Too often, the second victim retreats into a kind of self-imposed isolation at a time when both collegial and institutional support are needed. So I want to spend the rest of the hour talking about joy and how we can recapture that sense in our own lives as surgeons. I have told you that I will, three, I will incorporate three spheres of action, individual action, actions or strategies we can all incorporate, local action, that is action at the hospital, staff, county or state or provincial level, and global action. These are actions that our professional societies are undertaking and must expand on our behalf. While I will refer to the AMA, the American Medical Association, and parts of this talk, I hope you will translate it to your own national associations. First of all, let's acknowledge that what we do is miraculous and should give us joy. Let's talk about joy. Let me tell you a story. I need to explain that I've been studying narrative, narrative medicine right now. Uh, now, I'm not going to go all soft and fuzzy on you. I was forged in the same crucible as most of you. But when I retired from clinical practice, I became involved in narrative medicine as a way of helping our residents and others uh, recapture the sense of joy. And that's what I want to bring to you. So what is narrative medicine? We can think of it as part of the intersection between the humanities and clinical practice, and also as a set of tools that facilitate incorporation of the humanities in the medical training. It's both and more. I'm, I recently led a narrative medicine session for a group of pediatrics residents. I use a session format that incorporates three elements, close reading of a short piece of literature, a period of quiet, reflective writing, that is, writing in response to a prompt, and then time to share what is written. Sharing is completely voluntary. No preparation is required, and there is no homework. All this is done in a little under an hour, and ideally, food is served. So for this particular session, I used the William Carlos Williams poem, which begins, the young doctor is dancing with happiness in the sparkling wind, alone at the prow of the ferry. The poem concludes with just one more sentence. The entire piece is just two sentences, each ending with an exclamation point. We discuss the poem for about 15 minutes, speculating about the setting, the source of the doctor's happiness, and so on. Where was he going on the ferry? Perhaps to meet a loved one, maybe to a new job, a vacation. Why dancing? Why a doctor? Why alone? Then I gave him the writing prompt. Write about a time when you felt like dancing with happiness. Some wrote about hospital encounters, 
most wrote about profound personal experiences such as the birth of a child. We shared what we had written. As usual, some shared, but others did not. There's no pressure. At the conclusion of the hour, one resident said, we don't talk about joy enough. Think about that. We don't talk about joy enough. It seems to me as surgeons, we have two sources of joy, our personal lives and our professional lives. Within the hospital environment, we surgeons find joy in what we do for patients and in the exercise of our skill. A surgeon whom I respect greatly put it this way, it's the great results that are joyful, whether a cosmetic surgery or a life-saving one. Seeing the patient's results is a joy for me. Dr. Carlos Pellegrini. Oh, oh man, I know he's going to have a technological problem. Excuse me, guys. Let me get back. Okay. Thank you. Patient. Uh, so Dr. Car Carlos Pellegrini, in a keynote speech to the New York Surgical Society, invoked the Japanese concept of ikigai, an intersection of four conditions, what you love doing, what you are good at doing, what the world needs, and not to be forgotten, what you can get paid for. For us as surgeons, the super and physician of these four factors places us in that fortunate zone in the center of this Venn diagram. Think about it. Most of us went into surgery because we loved it. We loved the art and science and the difference that we make in the lives of our patients. Most of us are really good at it. The world definitely needs surgeons, and we get paid for it. When all four intersect, all is well. When one of the four is missing, so too is satisfaction. Look, for instance, at the incomplete intersection be between what you love here at the top and what you're good at, the pink area here. That leads to satisfaction but a feeling of uselessness unless your work is needed or rewarded. We as surgeons stand at the intersection of all four areas. Let's not forget that fortunate circumstance. I once asked a pediatric surgery colleague what his favorite operation was. I thought about all the difficult and life-saving operations he must perform on tiny infants, and I wondered if you would choose one of those. Perhaps the repair of a diaphragmatic hernia or a malrotation. He told me he gets the most satisfaction from doing a simple pyloral myotomy for hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. The improvement is dramatic, immediate, and life changing for both the small patient and the family. Everybody is happy. I became curious, so I queried other surgeons around the US asking, What's your absolutely favorite operation? This totally unscientific survey. I primed the, the pump by confessing that I had always loved to drain pus. I was amazed by the results. Some surgeons wrote a delicate or technically demanding operation, such as a Whipple, a parathyroidectomy, or a carotid endoarterectomy. Some wrote eloquently of their satisfaction with life changing operations particularly for patients who had no other recourse. Not necessarily dramatic saves, but operations that made a significant difference in a patient's life. Thus, one described incorporating conectivectomy into an incisional hernia repair, giving the patient a bonus and making their life so much easier after years. Another described repairing a scrotal hernia that, quotes, went down to the knees, and quotes, on a global outreach mission and the satisfaction of seeing the man walk away unencumbered afterwards. Some said, you know, the op my favorite operation is whatever I'm doing at the time, or that uh, they really love helping a resident do their first case. So just take a moment and think about your favorite operation. I recently talked to an ophthalmology resident about his career background. He's uncertain whether to do a fellowship or not. He really wants a small town practice. He'd like to go straight into practice out of residency, but he feels like he might be missing out on something. 
I asked him if he would, if he would be able to do cataracts in such a practice. Oh, yes. And then he enumerated a whole list of procedures he could do. These are all procedures which to a patient seem miraculous. Our ambulatory surgery nurses who have the task of calling patients the day after surgery tell me they love to call the cataract patients because they are so happy. I told him he owes it to himself to include something like this in his practice, to continue to have the satisfaction of making patients happy. That leads to my first recommendation. Focus on patient, not yourself. Yes, there you go. You know, in the early 1900s, Lord, Lord Monion of Leeds said, the most important person present at an operation is the patient. This is a truth not everywhere and always remembered. A corollary of this is the admonition to focus on task, not self. This simple advice was given year after year to our surgical residents by our program director at the University of Iowa, Dr. John Sharp. It helps avoid endless rumination about how much you wish you could get a cup of coffee, get home on time, grab a bite to eat, or even get a quick pit stop. I even wrote it myself during long nights on trauma call. It's a kind of mindfulness meditation, I think. Don't lose sight of the miraculous, the unexpected save or the everyday things we take for granted. Many years ago, a hospital chaplain allowed to observe a kidney transplant later told me that urine started to come out of the ureter as soon as the blood vessels were attached. She told me that the surgeon said, look, it's making pee. She said she felt she was standing upon sacred ground. Sacred ground. Talk with your patients. Learn their priorities and their concerns. We speak truth. Blunt and plain spoken to a fault, we are sometimes criticized for that. Yet who among us has not been called to the bedside of a patient and taken on the hard duty of explaining to patient and family that intervention is futile. The very concept of palliative care has grown from this sort of honest discussion of alternatives. When you make evening rounds, take time to sit down at the bedside. If COVID protocols allow, hold out your hand. Often the patient will reach out and grasp your hand with theirs. I loved to feel those warm fingers in mine, the human touch. Cherish your loved ones, take care of each other. Reach out to colleagues and peers. Consider the nurses and others in the hospital as colleagues. You're all working together to help patients. Can you form a support group? Start small. Find and cultivate interests outside of surgery. This painting by Dr. John Palmer illustrates just one of his many interests outside of surgery. Another interest, in February 1973, he held his first one-man show, 50 paintings at the Framing Gallery in Toronto. I'll tell you later about what he did with the log cabin. It's going to blow your mind. Make time for your own spiritual life, whatever that may be. Something as simple as making a list at the end of the day of things that you are grateful for can lift your mood. Cultivate compassion and maintain a sense of humor. Develop resilience, the quality that is often cited as an antidote to burning. Don't forget the young people. Take time to teach. When we teach, we nurture our own souls as well as those of the students. The very word doctor is derived from the Latin word for teacher. For those of us in academic positions, teaching is an integral part of our tripartite mission, but you don't have to be an academic surgeon to make teaching part of your daily routine. Teaching is like watering a garden. Both the garden and the gardener are nurtured. Teach everyone around you. Of course, educate your patients and your families. 
but also teach the nurses, the aides, the CRNAs. Share your knowledge in little moments of enlightenment and be prepared to listen and to learn yourself. Collegial conversation with physicians and other specialties educates both. Seek opportunities to educate the lay public. What it's a few words about breast cancer at halftime during the Think Pink women's basketball game or course on basic anatomy and physiology for senior citizens. Such activities enrich both the community and nurture your soul. Consider surgical volunteerism. If you're not already involved, learn about the ACS operation, giving back, or other opportunities through your own associations. Surgeons who have done this state that it gives you a new perspective on the problems that we face. Be prepared to periodically reinvent yourself and to see these reinventions as opportunities to explore a new terrain. I tell our trainees and students that you'll need to do this about every five years or so. The necessity for reinvention may come from within as your practice changes or from technological innovation in your area of practice. Dr. Palmer, as we know, a general surgeon, a surgical oncologist, a tremendous specialist, he embraced the then new discipline of bariatric surgery and facilitated the availability of one of the first operations, vertical banded gastroplasty in Canada. Technological innovation can be explosive and cataclysmic, or it can be evolutionary. I and many of the older surgeons in this audience have experienced both. In 1987, the first lap coli was performed, and in 1989, the first series of cases was published. That was cataclysmic change. Until that moment, laparoscopy had been primarily a gynecologist's tool. It was used for diagnostic purposes by a small number of visionary surgeons. And cholecystectomy, one of the most common operations performed by general surgeons, was done through a big open subcostal incision. The new operation came into widespread use without the benefit of institutional review boards or randomized clinical trials. We learned a lot from that experience and we do things better now, I think. SAGES, the Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons, stepped into the breach and developed training programs and materials. Every general surgeon in practice had to decide whether or not to adopt a new technique. Some took this as an opportunity to retire but the early adopters and their skills rapidly developed the instruments, techniques, and applications we are still using today. How do you learn new skills? You build upon old skills, you fall back upon transferable skills, you read everything you can, and you take every advantage of training opportunities given through national organizations. See the rapid pace of change as an opportunity to bring new advances to our patients. Don't see it as a hurdle that we must surmount. Black Coley required a completely new skill set. Most changes haven't been that cataclysmic. So a more typical example from general surgery might be the use of ultrasound guidance to perform breast biopsies, seroma aspirations, and lumpectomy. Here, skills gained in one area of practice for example, doing fast focused abdominal sonography for trauma exams during trauma call may be transferable to breast ultrasound. As I grew older and my practice shifted to mostly breast, um, I had to um, I had to acquire a lot of new skills. Sentinel lymphoma biopsy, nipple sparing, mastectomy, ultrasound guide, breast biopsy. I also needed certification in ultrasound. And I got that through the American College of Surgeons. They had an online course in basic ultrasound and then a hands-on course at the American Society of Breast Surgeons. My point is this, just as suturing and knot tying are transferable skills, so are facility of ultrasound, the Seldinger technique, and other fundamentals. And this makes accommodating evolutionary change in our practice abilities. And the, 
the process of adapting to change and learning new things is enriching to you as well as the patients. Our surgical societies are provide, providing and must continue to provide training opportunities for surgeons whose practice pattern changes who move into a different practice and needing skills or those who need to wish to bring new techniques to their community. We need to be nimble to anticipate and produce high quality educational offerings that facilitate skills acquisition by moving as we do during a difficult dissection from known to unknown. And don't forget the multidisciplinary aspect of the practice. For example, the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy to downstage malignancy. Seek additional education and management, leadership, teaching, and other non-medical issues as appropriate. Take advantage, advantage of short courses at national meetings, typically a day or even just a half day. Distance learning and online courses are available to augment your knowledge in almost any area. I was fortunate to have evening courses at Millsaps College just around the corner when I wanted to go for an MBA to get management training. Now there are low residency programs at many big name schools. Consider your tuition to be an investment in your own future. Cherish diversity and each other. View your individual differences as sources of strength rather than weakness. Here are two female astronauts preparing for the first all-female spacewalk on the International Space Station. It, it was a revolution at the time made the news. And you might ask, why did it take so long and why was it remarkable? So if you think about biological diversity in the context of space travel, to take an extreme example, in 2013, I served on a committee and paneled by NASA to look at ethical issues related to the human exploration of space. What should NASA do if a particular mission would exceed allowable exposure parameters to radiation, for example? Think about Mars. A lot of radiation exposure probably going to exceed recommended levels. What's the ethical way to proceed? Women are more susceptible to radiation uh, than men or are thought to be so. There's some actually some dispute about that. Should they be excluded from these missions? What is the ethical way to, uh, to proceed? Well, I learned several things from this experience, but the one most directly relevant to today's topic is that there is no perfect and vulnerable astronaut, just as there is no perfect uh, surgeon. In the astronaut population, although women may be more susceptible to radiation, they're typically smaller than, than men. And that means they consume less oxygen and less food. And that's a real bonus when you're going all the way to Mars and you've got half everything you need in your rocket. They do not appear to be susceptible, as susceptible as men, to the radiation changes associated with microgravity and so on. Strengths and weaknesses complement each other. So spacesuits no longer come in just one size. And like the Procrustean bed, the astronaut no longer needs to be chosen to fit the suit. Sure, NASA had to scramble to come up with two of the right size for this particular spacewalk, and it was embarrassing. But the point is that the system was able to accommodate. There is strength and diversity. Let's shift focus to the institutional level. I would urge you to seek leadership opportunities by becoming involved in the various committees of your hospital. Reinvigorate the meetings of your county or regional medical society. At the very least, this allows collegial interaction with other specialists. And at the best, it provides an avenue through the medical society and the national organization to advocate for legislative and systemic change become active in the surgical section of your local medical society. Similarly, participate in the American College of Surgeons and other surgical societies. These can provide a wonderful forum for networking, sharing views, and advocating for change. In July 2019, 
the American College of Surgeons announced the ACS Thrive Program, an acronym for transferring, transforming healthcare resources to increase value and efficiency. It's a relatively new joint initiative with the Harvard Business School. New initiatives become opportunities for involvement, and those who are involved write the documents that are then trickled down to the rest of us. To influence the future, you need to be at the table. Get involved in these efforts. And I'm going to speak mostly to the young surgeons in the audience. Volunteer, participate, and say yes rather than saying no in an opportunity arises. I know that a lot of the advice now is be selective, don't overextend yourself, but I would urge you to say yes whenever possible to any opportunity that your professional life offers. Time appears to be a fixed quantity with there are only 24 hours in a day, but it is a highly elastic one. The old saying, work expands to fill the time available can be turned on its head and you can find time to do the work that you love. Don't assume that you are too young, too old, or inherently not qualified. If you are interested, put your name forward or have a colleague do so. If you are turned down, just do it again with another group. Remember that you may be rejected for what seems like a trivial reason and you'll never know this. For example, you might simply be a member of the wrong specialty or the wrong area of the country if they're looking for regional representation. That's got nothing to do with your inherent work. I often invoke the rule of threes because I used it throughout my career. One out of three tries should succeed. If you succeed every time, you're not aiming high enough in my estimation. If you never succeed, you need to re-examine your goals. But if you can succeed one out of three times, you're doing well. Rejection is part of life, not necessarily something to be feared. Now for US surgeons, uh, the annual ACS Advocacy and Leadership Summit in Washington, DC provides didactic sessions and training and leadership, as well as access to legislators. Is there a similar program in Canada? I don't know. Is there a need? If we do not educate our lawmakers, who will? In the US, it's big pharma, hospital associations, and now practice attorneys, to name just a few. I previously mentioned the surgical section of the AMA. I'd like to briefly highlight an AMA program called Steps Forward. And a lot of this is available on the web, so you can set and access it without being an AMA member. So this program, Steps Forward, consists of a series of modules to empower teams to identify and attain appropriate goals and tactics well matched to your practice's specific needs and environments. Now, one of the modules is creating the organizational foundation for joy in medicine, organizational changes that lead to physician satisfaction. Note the focus organizational changes that lead to physician satisfaction. At the individual level, make time for wellness. Find a way to incorporate stress relief and physical exercise in your daily routine, even if all you can do is park your car at the far end of the parking lot and walk briskly to and from the hospital or the metro station. The University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, where I practiced and continue to teach, has miles and miles of corridors and skywalks. I bet your hospital does too. Follow good health habits. Find and use a good primary care job. Make room in your life for the humanities and creativity. I have mentioned Dr. Palmer's love of patient, of painting. So, you know, I'm reading this to try to avoid saying the wrong thing and I'm screwing up, so forgive me. So I want to get back to Dr. Palmer for a minute. Did you know that in 1967, he dismantled a pioneer log house and reconstructed it near his family cottage in Crete, Ontario? That, that's an interesting thing to do. It has nothing to do with surgery. 
one of our hospital chaplains, not the one I mentioned previously, always carried a small piece of paper or a set of small pieces of paper with uh, poems on the in her pockets. And if she ran across you in the hallway, she would hand you one and say, here's a pocket poem. How long does it take to read a pocket poem or to write a brief poem yourself, draw a quick sketch or take a photograph of rabbit tracks in the fresh snow or the sun shining through the autumn leaves? If you are in the latter half of your career, think about and prepare for retirement. Find ways to stay involved. Modify your practice if necessary to accommodate the inevitable changes of aging. I came off trauma calls when I got over 60. It was time. I wasn't up for these 36 hour shifts with the adrenaline rush. Cultivate other interests. If you are just starting out, take charge of your career and shape it to the form you wish it to assume. I spent my entire life in academics and it's been a wonderful journey. I've trained surgeons who went on to become academic leaders and surgeons who went into small rural practices. I'm proud of all of them. Whatever you do, devote yourself to your patients, your family, your job, and your community. Dr. David Welsh, a general surgeon in rural practice in the US wrote this moving account of a day well spent. He describes attending various community events and then being stopped by a volunteer who reminds him that 18 years ago, he saved her life and the life of her unborn child. And the child will graduate from high school this year. I was speechless, humbled, and honored. It is uplifting to be in a position to fight for the lives of all ages including those yet to be born. This is another reason I love being a surgeon, especially in the world. So. Let me end as I began with Dr. Palmer, here shown painting outdoors, his favorite sayings. We were drawn to a career in surgery, not because it was easy or expected, but because of our passion for the art and science. Let's use that passion as a catalyst to change the system, our institution, and our lives for the better. Our interventions as surgeons forever change lives, not just those of our patients, but also their families. And sometimes we affect the very fabric of a community. We need to fight back vigorously, both individually and collectively, against the forces that would stifle our sense of wonder and reduce us to mere technicians. We stand, you stand, at the intersection between disease and wellness, offering, if not cure, at least significant improvement. Take strength and joy from that. Thank you. And Jason, you can cut the slides if, if you will. Thank you so much. That was an amazing lecture. and. Um, really such a wonderful tribute uh, to Dr. Palmer. It really felt like uh, uh, an exposition uh, really, you know, throughout your lecture. So thank you very much uh, for that. Um, we have um, a few moments. Um, if uh, I'm just gonna look at the, the chat or if there's any, any questions or, or comments um, from anyone. Jim? Yeah, th thanks, Alan. And, and Carol, thank you very much. That was uh, a wonderful overview for all of us and to, for all of us to take stock in what we're doing each day uh, to make ourselves um, better surgeons for our patients and to make sure that we, we all do it in the right way. I guess, um, you know, my question to you relates to um, a lot of what you, you talked about, spoke of the individual choice to pursue initiatives or activities that make you uh, mindful, uh, less stressed, um, better capable to look after your patients and to do your job at the hospitals. So uh, for me, and, and also for you, since you're a previous uh, chair of a, a large department, what is the departmental 
response or what, what, what can departments offer, you know, widespread across, um, you know, all the, the faculty? What should we be doing? What have you seen that's worked uh, as a recipe in other departments? What, what are your thoughts on a departmental approach? Yeah, it's not a one size fits all. Uh, what, what one surgeon needs may not be what another surgeon needs. Uh, one of the needs that has come to the forefront and that we're very active in is ergonomics. Uh, simply the effort of doing, for example, thyroidectomies or parathyroidectomies on morbidly obese patients and feeling like you're hanging over the operating table and emerging stiff at the end of the case. Anything you can done to help that, having the right instruments. Just simple. I mean, these are simple, simple mechanical fixes. This is not um, meditation. It's not yoga. For other people, it might be uh, taking a few minutes at the beginning of the case to talk with the team. We have a routine uh, preoperative debriefing, but using that also to just be mindful of the patient and uh, remember what we're about to do, that sort of thing. For others, it might be exercise. So having exercise facilities available if people want to use it. We have access to our cardiac rehab facilities, which are right inside the hospital. So anything that's not being used by patients, if a physician or really any staff member, but I think it's called most of physicians, wants to go in and run on the treadmill for 15 minutes, they can do it. Um, I knew a surgeon who used to just run the stairs, run up the stairs, run down the stairs, run up the stairs, run down the stairs. Um, but making it easy for people to do what, whatever helps them. Talking to people, having somebody, uh, having someone, if you're a large department, you know, having someone who's in charge of wellness is I think ideal. And that person should just talk to people and find out what do you need? What can we do to help you? Uh, are you having trouble getting childcare? How can we help work with that? Childcare has been a huge issue in the US during the pandemic. It was a huge issue before the pandemic. And it's become a lot worse with the unpredictability of schools being open or not. So I think communication and being able to access a variety of options. And if you think of it, you know, for, it's, it's actually, I think, easier for a large hospital, like the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics, or maybe for some of your hospitals, because you have many, many departments. So instead of each department inventing itself, you can share resources, and uh, it, it just makes it easier for everybody. So those are some of my thoughts. Great. Thank you. Carol, I was really interested in your your description of the, you know, the second victim as well, because, um, you know, as surgeons, I was wondering your, your thoughts on, you know, uh, quality improvement rounds. They're, they're such an important cornerstone of improving care learning. And I know as someone who, you know, chairs rounds and can sometimes sense the, the stress and anxiety from from surgeons as cases are being discussed. Um, do you have any experience, you know, in your leadership roles or in attending some of these rounds of ways, practices in your own group that you've made these uh, a, a positive experience that, that don't contribute to that second victim, you know, feeling among surgeons? I, I think the big thing is to keep a systems approach because it's rarely one thing, you know, as one as surgeons, if something goes wrong, we almost automatically take blame for it. We assume the responsibility. That's the way we're trained. That's sort of the way it should be. But in fact, it's often many things that, that contributed to, to the event. So taking a systems approach, to, as you said, quality improvement, very important. Uh, I think one of the problems that I alluded to on an earlier slide was weaponized peer review. That's not quality improvement. That's selectively cherry picking bad cases and trying to drive someone out of practice. It happens at small hospitals in the US. I don't know if it's a problem in Canada or not. But, um, but anyway, 
it, it has to be a systems approach. And when you do management uh, training and you learn about continuous quality improvement, one of the things they talk about is empowering anyone on the team to speak up if they see a problem. So for an assembly line, for example, in a factory, they will say anybody has the power to stop the line or something's wrong. And you want to you want to cultivate that atmosphere and that attitude in the work environment. So if something doesn't look right or if something just is wrong, no one's afraid to speak up. It's complicated. I agree, it's complicated. But it is absolutely the best way to, that we have currently to continue to improve quality. Well, that's, uh, that's great. I think it's, uh, it's approaching 8.30. And uh, normally at this point, we would present you with some gifts and uh, tokens of our appreciation. Uh, we do have those and we will send those uh, to you at home. And so on behalf of the entire uh, department at the University of Toronto, just want to thank you again for a wonderful and inspirational lecture. Uh, a very nice tribute to Dr. Palmer and hope to have the opportunity to meet uh, in person sometime in the near future. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. I know we didn't get to all the questions. I have an email and I answer my email. So uh, I'm always happy to hear from people. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Yeah, you as well. Carol. See you. Thanks. Thanks, Alan.